Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast, or you can subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. Views expressed by participants are personal. Today's guest, Ray Reed, has one of the most well-rounded careers in the media world. He started out client-side working for companies like IBM. This was back in the day when people were still trying to figure out how the internet would fit into their marketing mix. He pivoted slightly, venturing into the world of digital research with Comscore before moving into ad operations at Alliance Atlantis. It's rare for people to leave a media supplier for the agency world. Typically, it's the other way around. But that's exactly what Ray did as he moved into senior leadership roles at agencies like Starcom MediaVest and Neo at Ogilvy. You can add two other titles to Ray's resume, notably entrepreneur and educator. He's gone out on his own, not once, but twice, as the founder and CEO of Advertise, a media investment agency and consulting firm with a focus on all digital platforms, and Digital Ad Lab, an educational service with the mission of bringing hands-on and theoretical programmatic advertising education and training to the masses. You are the third entrepreneur I have had in a row on the program, but you wear two hats. Tell us about uh, Advertise and Digital Ad Lab. So um, we started both companies, Advertise and Digital Ad Lab, about a year ago, actually, June 15, 2015. Um, the two companies are somewhat related but are completely independent entities. The Digital Ad Lab, um, whose main purpose is to fill the skills gap that exists uh, in the advertising industry as it pertains to the knowledge and understanding of digital advertising, uh, we created specifically to address that skills gap that was existing uh, for quite some time. Advertise is a combination of an advertising agency and consulting firm that we built uh, with a specific methodology about helping clients um, better utilize their data um, to be able to action in whatever way they wish to. Um, so both companies uh, are currently you know, in operation a year old and doing quite well. Okay, let's go back to the beginning and learn more about you. So where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, moved there from Jamaica where I was born, um, but lived in Vancouver for about seven, eight years and then before coming to Ontario. Oh, nice. So what? how old were you when you moved from uh, from Jamaica to uh, Vancouver? Uh, seven years old. Seven years old. So you, yeah. you remember your time back in Jamaica then? Oh, great deal and very fondly. Very fondly. Did you get used to the snow, though, when you moved over to Vancouver? I know Vancouver doesn't have too much snow. On no. The ground. No, you didn't get used to didn't it. Didn't get used to it because here you have, you know, some of you fish out of water looking at snow for the first time going, what is this stuff falling from the sky? <laughs> you have absolutely no clue what it is, and you don't know why uh, it melts. Tell us about your time growing up, though. Did you have any hobbies or interests, any people that influenced you? Um, well, growing up in Vancouver, the, the, the culture out there is so much of an outdoor lifestyle. So my parents had me active in three sports, um, baseball, track and field, and soccer all at the same time. Just traveling up and down the west coast of BC and the, um, the west coast of the United States, active in sports all the time. And that's what I was doing majority of the time while I was there. Being from Jamaica, though, you weren't a cricket person. You didn't export that or bring no. that with you? <laughs> my parents were big cricket fans, but not me. So when did you uh, make it over to Ontario again? Well, um, prior to just uh, junior high school, I came um, to Ontario when I was about uh, 12, 13, um, and enrolled in junior high in Scarborough. Um, my parents decided, you know, move east, greater opportunities and so forth. Uh, I hated the decision at the time, of course, just because <laughs> all my friends were out in BC, so that really uh, that was really uh, a difficult thing for me, but you adjusted with time. But doesn't that make you a stronger person, though? hitting the reboot button on your life over and over again because you left all your friends behind in Jamaica, left them, started again in Vancouver, and then you had to do it again when you moved to Toronto. Absolutely. Certainly as an only child, it's one of the things you see your parents are moving around all the time is that you get used to that and you make new friends everywhere you go. So you naturally become somewhat of an outgoing person because you're always new somewhere else. And so you end up, you know, developing that skill pretty early. And for university, you decided to stay in Toronto. Where did you end up going? Went to Ryerson, um, primarily because my parents, my father was a professor at Ryerson. <laughs> so I graduated without any um, any student debt, <laughs> which was uh, which was pretty awesome. 
It wasn't my first choice. I actually had a basketball scholarship to Eastern Michigan University. Oh, geez. And that was what I wanted to pursue. But my parents said, no, you're going to stay here and go to school. <laughs> did you want to kind of try to make a professional career at a basketball? Or did no. you just see you just saw basketball just, as a chance to go to school in the States on a scholarship? Absolutely. Go to school in the States on a scholarship and have fun. Um, who wouldn't love that coming out of high school? No, absolutely. I'm not an athlete. I'm not very good at anything. So <laughs> you can't get a scholarship for podcasting. <laughs> It's the other way around. Not, you not have to yet. throw money into it. What did you study when you were at Ryerson? Uh, you know, that's an interesting subject because the, the, the course, I've looked back over the years and I haven't been able to find and see this discontinued or involved into something else. It was a program called Information Technology Management. Did you jump into that with a bigger plan? Like, was that part of the plan or was that just something that you said, hey, this is interesting? I've got to go to Ryerson because uh, my dad wants me there and so let me try it out. To, to be truthful, I was just computer nerd. Okay. So I've been writing code uh, on Apple computers since I was 11 years old, which was the other thing I did. So it seemed to be the only thing that was really interesting that I sort of had and um, gravitated to. And this was pre-internet. So this was the only thing, hey, get into software, and there's a career in software somewhere. So you wrote code on like 12, three and a half, your program was 12, three and a half floppy disks. Or Pretty much. And wrote it on the Mac 2, wrote it on, a, you know, one of the first Mac computers called Jennifer when they used to name them. Um, oh, wow. Way back then. So we're a long way from iPod. <laughs> we're a very long way from iPod. So, you know, to me, I've always been a computer illiterate and it just seemed to be something that, you know, was um, close to what I was interested in. And after graduation, what, what was your first gig? Uh, this is really had nothing to do with school as many people do when they come out of school. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I ended up working at Kinko's. Okay. Prior to being bought by FedEx, I ended up being doing graphic design at Kinko's in Toronto. Was it still 24 hours back then? It was 24 hours, and those night shifts on the weekends were awesome. Did you have a lot of people come in saying, help me build my business cards at like 3.30 in the morning? 3.30 in the morning. Really? 2 in the morning, at 1 a.m., 6 a.m. What kind of companies are they hot? Are they building business cards for at that time at 3.30 a.m.? Anything from entertainment to small business guys doing plumbing, doing anything, they would come in at that time of the night. We saw some interesting characters uh, in the overnight shift. It was always entertaining. You got to love that when you've got a job that maybe it's not what you want to do for the rest of your life, but it just so it's so interesting that you want to keep going in shift after shift. It was you never knew what would happen on a nightly basis. It, it was always an adventure when you worked on a weekend shift uh, in twenty four hours. So when was your first gig in media? I didn't actually start in anything related to media for quite some time. Um, I worked throughout the dot-com, the 1999, 2000 dot-com boom, working in a couple startup companies here in Toronto. I worked for IBM Global Services out of Toronto and New York. And then um, was funny enough, was laid off from IBM Global Services. And I was looking for an opportunity, and I started doing some research in this whole area where digital advertising or Internet advertising was taking off. And I was reading Forrester reports, Gartner reports, and uh, I was looking for an opportunity in Toronto, and I came across this company called Comscore, mm. or at the time it was called Jupiter Media Metrics, um, prior to Comscore Media Metrics. And I called them up, and I said, listen, I'm off work, and I want to get into this area. I'll come work for you for free. Really? You were willing to do that just for free to get in? I was door. willing to do that just for free. And I had called Forrester. I called Gartner. I called all the research companies that were doing anything related to Internet, um, internet reporting, advertising, research. And I said, I gave the same spiel. Hey, I'm looking for work. I'll come work for you for six months to learn the industry. Nobody took me up on it except for um, a lady at um, Comscore um, who said, you know what? We don't have any budget for this, but if you want to come in and learn and help us do some things and figure out some things, we'd be happy to help you. So I came in, turned out they were like three blocks away from my house where I lived at the time. I went in, met with them, and I started working there for probably about five, six months, um, literally just for free. Jeez, and what did you learn in those five or six months that made you want to continue with the company? Well, what I learned was that this whole area was just taking off. We're talking about 2002, 2003, where people were still debating whether or not this thing called Internet advertising or the Internet was going to become a, um, a mainstream medium. And so Comscore, Jupiter, Comscore Media Metrics was selling the research that said, hey, this thing is actually going to be significant because all the metrics, 
are increasing day after day, month over month in terms of consumption of pe- consumption of time online, what people were doing, where they were doing it, and so forth. And to me, that was like, this is, this is something interesting. This is going to take off. So, you know, I spent as much time as I could working and helping the company as possible before eventually uh, I was quite fortunate. After about six months, they offered me a, jo- a full-time job. Oh, nice. And after that, you went to Alliance Atlantis. Yep. Tell us about your time at Alliance Atlantis because people, when they go client side or supplier side, it's usually by way of agency supplier side. They don't usually go from the research side into supplier side. So how did you fall into that? That was quite interesting. It was uh, actually through a, a colleague, an industry colleague of mine who had seen me in my role at Comscore. Um, you know, during those those days, there was still a lot of turbulence in the industry. And so I was looking for a new opportunity, and she said, hey, we have this role over at Alliance Atlantis. It's in this area of advertising operations. Um, it, it pays moderately well. Would you be interested in it? And I said, absolutely. It sounded like this is the area I wanted to get into. And I would learn a lot by having my hands involved in the software and the technology. So I went to uh, Alliance Atlantis in 2005 as an advertising uh, operations associate, um, which at that time was really the beginning of ad operations in Canada. What was it like managing ad operations back then? Because, I mean, we've got this whole system in place. Usually people will use something like uh, Google's Dart for Publishers to map out where ads should go and serve them on their website. But what were the challenges you had back then? Well, back then, the software was not as sophisticated as now. Um, We were still using um, what was called uh, DFA, Dart for Advertisers, back then, uh, or just plain Dart. And it was not as sophisticated as it is now in that there was a lot of functionality, which was extremely manual. Um, They've automated a lot of it today, but it was extremely manual and tedious. So you would spend hours and hours doing the most manual tasks, and sometimes if you made an error, you'd have to start all over again. Oh, or God. if you made a mistake, or if you even accidentally hit the back button, everything would be wiped out. <laughs> oh, God. And you'd have to start all over again. So it was a very painful process. Were ads, and I wasn't in the industry back back then, but had digital ads been standardized at least, so there was still a big box, a leaderboard? Or did you was that kind of ad hoc then? They were starting to be standardized at that point in time. You had the IAB had released their first, um, you know, sort of standard ad package of what the ads were, your 728 by 90s or the precursors to those, um, or 728 by 60s, I think, at the time. And so they started to be standardized, um, but there were still a lot of Wild West characters in terms of different ad formats that you can get. And working in Alliance Atlantis, I was working on HGTV.ca, FoodTV.ca, Showcase.ca, mm, okay. and so forth. So we were responsible for managing all the ads delivered on those sites um, across all of them at once. Was it still really robust back then? Like, had it taken off? Because I found that earlier on websites were just built because someone felt, well, we need a website now. They weren't really utilizing the full potential of the Internet, but were you guys doing that back then? We, I, I, I have to say that the team in Alliance Atlantis was really um, leading, leading the charge in Canada because we were doing things that people were not yet doing. Like, we developed, to my recollection, the first synchronized – um, pre-roll and big box ad unit, which is pretty standard today. Yep, it is. But for the pre-roll and the big box to be called at the same time and to be synced at the same time on video, uh, in a video, in the standardized video player, was still something new then. And we were doing that at that time. And we were just also rolling out takeovers and all kinds of things. So we were pretty much on top of where things were going at the time, which was pretty awesome. Would you consider your move to Starcom Media Vest, your first four-way, into the agency side of things? Absolutely. So that was an interesting move because I hadn't really, to be honest, had any interest in, a- in agencies. I'd only heard negative things about agencies, <laughs> and I had no You were interest. talking to a lot of sales reps, I <laughs> <laughs> I only heard negative things about agencies, and um, you know, I, I spoke to a, a, a good friend of mine, and I asked him, and I said, you know, uh, he's been in the industry for a while. And I said, you know, tell me, w- what is the real opportunity here? And he said, you know, they're, they're, they're a shop that's looking for growth and has opportunity, but there are challenges. And at the time, I had an executive coach, and he said, well, you've sort of done all these other areas. If you went into media, you would complete your full profile. And as a result, you could then do whatever you wanted to do. He's got a point there because, I mean, that's kind of like if you want to even call it the Holy Trinity, you've got research on your side, you've got ad operations, and then 
media and marketing. That's what the agencies do now. So Exactly. So that appealed to me. So I went to Starcom. Um, I was quite honest. I said I had no actually background in advertising. Are you sure you wanted to hire me? And to their courageous, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to their courage, they actually said, yep, yeah, we need somebody who understands this digital and this internet advertising thing. And um, so I joined them and started my media career. You spent a considerable amount of time there, and it was at a period when the internet really started to realize its full potential from a media and a marketing perspective. Are, are there certain accomplishments, campaigns, uh, anything you've worked, anything you've done with any of the clients that you're particularly proud of? Oh yeah, that was when things really took off. I'd say between 2000 and 2000, 2008 and 2012, where things really took off. There are a couple of things that um, I was really proud of, but the number one thing that I'm most proud of that most people don't even remember today was the launch of Ally Bank in Canada. Um, that was the ex-GMAC, wasn't it? That was the ex-GMAC. After, after the recession, that's what GM resurrected. That's what GM resurrected. GMAC. So GMAC became Ally Bank in Canada to do both more um, you know, um, loans as well as investment products. And so we launched Ally Bank in Canada, which was the first real competitor to ING Direct at the time. Great thing about that campaign is that they came in very aggressive into the Canadian market. And we had we had what I think was the largest digital advertising budget at the time. It was nearly twelve million dollars of pure digital in one year, and we bought everything on the internet. I think we were number one in terms of total impressions delivered in a year at over ten billion impressions. You must have had a legion of sales reps hanging outside of your office we, or in the lobby at Starcom. Everybody was was in on it. <laughs> everybody wanted in on it. But the best thing about that campaign was that the client had a goal of 12% um, market awareness um, in, the, in a year. We generated 25%. Oh, nice. And then as a result, when the unfortunate downturn in the economy happened in the U.S., Ally was looking to sell its assets um, and they sold uh, Ally Canada to RBC for $4 billion, and RBC shut it down the next day. That's what happened to it, because I remember that they were very heavy, not just in a digital, but every platform or medium possible, and then just one day it seemed to evaporate. One day it was, just, it was there, and it was gone. And so to me, it's the most successful advertising campaign that I, I've ever seen where you generated such – such a fear in the marketplace that somebody bought you for $4 billion just to shut you down. You mentioned their objective was 12% awareness. Are those the kind of objectives you like hearing from clients? Because it seems like those are ones that you can measure success yes. on. You, having clients that have clear, measurable goals, they had a they had a tangible goal of generating over a billion dollars in deposits in a year. We exceeded that, which you think about the Canadian marketplace at the time was a brand new entity coming into the country, convincing Canadians that this is a real legitimate uh, company, go online and invest money without a physical retail location. This was quite a, uh, a hurdle. It's funny you mention that because we are seeing more. They are probably the original virtual bank. And my wife and I, we're with Tangerine right now. And when my parents heard that, they're just like, but, but who do you talk to? They, they can't get away from the whole bricks and mortar thing. They don't understand it. But other people I know within my age range are like, no, tell us more about these virtual banks. We're thinking of going that way. Exactly. And and Ally was really the one that opened the door. ING was doing a really good job, but uh, Ally came in with an American mentality that this is, you know, this is where we're going. We're going to go hard and aggressive for it. And so to me, I, I look upon that as a great success because we bought everything on the Internet. We bought and tried new things that hadn't been done in this marketplace. And it was the first time I really fell in love with a client who understand the power of data. Um, econometric modeling that we were doing back in 2009 is still not commonplace today for many advertisers. Uh, leveraging data across all touch points, um, multi-channel marketing and doing that to drive towards a digital footprint. All things that I think marketers are still trying to do correctly today we were doing back in 2009, 2010. There was one other thing that happened during that period, programmatic advertising. Digital advertising really started to take off, and you did something very unique. And I want to say it was probably the first of its kind in Canada, maybe in North America. Uh, tell us about the private marketplace you put together with all of NTC Media. Yeah, that was uh, that was a result of the combination of working with Ally and spending so much time in the U.S. So one of the benefits of working with Ally was I was down in the U.S. every other week, and so I had a, a, a great deal of exposure to this whole area of programmatic that was coming in place in the U.S. 
However, I noticed something that was fundamentally wrong with the way they were doing it, doing it in the U.S. is that they were doing it with what I call at the time people were talking about as remnant advertising, remnant inventory. And I saw an opportunity to approach the publishers in the marketplace and say, listen, I know you're not sold out 100%. What are you doing with your remaining inventory? And if we brokered a deal programmatically between us, could I buy that inventory where you're not getting anything for it? Now, I'll pay you a price for it. So instead of them getting zero for it, I'd pay them $4 for it. So I organized a meeting of probably about 12 publishers, a bunch of agencies uh, in late 2011 where I brought everybody together and um, we brought up a key um, programmatic speaker from the U.S., to talk about this and put a challenge on the table to all the publishers in Canada that I would put $2 million into this marketplace to get it started. And so a few people um, got on board. Olive Media got on board. TC Media got on board. Casali Media was involved, was, was the facilitator of it. And we built the first private, mar private marketplace product in Canada in early 2012. And then after your time at Starcom, you moved over to Neo at Ogilvy. What brought you there? Well, the thing that I saw was that um, being a digital practitioner um, had a lifespan because every, one day everything was going to be digital. And so what happens is that agencies had built these silos where you had digital people and you had traditional people. Mm -hmm. And that was not a sustainable model for agencies. Um, you couldn't have one group over here treated one way and another group over here treated another way. And eventually the agencies would say, okay, well, how do we get rid of these expensive digital people and just train the traditional people who cost less on digital? And I so I saw that being a digital expert had a lifespan. And to me, it was clear that at some point in the future, everything was going to be digital. So I wanted to actually go the reverse and go traditional and apply digital thinking to traditional media. Okay. And, and so the opportunity at Neo at Ogilvy was to go and actually run an entire agency, but be a digital person running an agency that was doing television, print, radio, out of home, but do it with a digital mindset, knowing that all those channels all led to digital. So if you started with the end in mind, then you can optimize all those channels to the way in which consumers were engaging. Tell us about your clients you worked with, anything in particular that you're really proud of that you accomplished there, anything like that? Oh, the, the biggest client that we had and I had the opportunity to work on, which was a tremendous opportunity, was I went back to my IBM days. Okay. And that our largest client at Ogilvy um, was IBM Canada. And so I had an opportunity to work and lead the IBM business in Canada, also work very closely with all our counterparts in New York who ran the New York, who ran the U.S. Um, uh, IBM business. And, in fact, the North American IBM business was sort of centralized out of New York, and so we were integrated in that team. And so we had the opportunity to work on all sides of the IBM business, and today you're starting to see the new IBM come to market in terms of things that they were thinking about and putting in place back in, in those days. Was this pre or post them selling their hardware division to Lenovo and becoming just more of a software company? Or this, a was company just post them, this was just them post-selling the Lenovo business. It was clear that software as a service was where they were going. And you you saw them start to really beef up in the areas of analytics and Watson, which is now you know one of their leading um, product platforms. In June of 2014, though, you resigned from Neo at Ogilvy to go out on your own. You were on top of the media industry here, and you decided to become an entrepreneur. What was the driving factor behind that? I had achieved uh, a great deal of success, humbly, that I would say in terms of my, my growth and opportunities. I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that I've been given throughout my career. But once again, I, I've always had my eye on where are things going and where are the opportunities. And one thing that has always stuck with me was that there is a significant issue with the education and understanding of digital advertising. And it was actually out of a position of fear that more and more marketers are putting dollars into digital, but they're not getting not it's not meeting their expectations. And the issue I found was education and transparency. And I said, well, this needs to be tackled, um, but nobody seems interested in tackling it because everybody's sort of benefiting from the lack of awareness and mm. knowledge and understanding that was out there. So to me, it was like if everybody's swimming in this direction and nobody wants to pay attention to something else, then that's an opportunity. And obviously, probably a harder opportunity to pursue, but that was something that was interesting to me. And the other thing was that I saw that 
people had not really grasped, um, had developed a good grasp of the understanding of data and how it could be applied to improve targeting and measurement and um, audience segmentation. And so those are two opportunities I saw at the same time. So what came first? Were, were they simultaneous? Uh Digital ad lab or advertise? They both were simultaneous. As I started to think through one, um, it became clear to me that the other one actually was very synergistic to it. Um, I, I wanted to continue um, working in the media space, working in the advertising space. And I thought there was an opportunity to do something unique there. But when I was doing that, I also had this really strong desire to address this issue of training and education that nobody was addressing. And so that's uh, that's why I created that. Tell us a little bit about the training and education that Digital Ad Lab does. I had the the opportunity to take one of your classes a couple weekends ago. It was the boot camp class where we focused on all things programmatic, rooted in uh, DBM, DFP, uh, DCM. I'm so bad with the ad. <laughs> you, you've got them all. I've got them all down. You've got them all. And i got to tell you, I paid for this out of my own pocket. That was my first time meeting you. And if anyone's listening to this, go take Ray's course. Go Thank you. Go check out Digital Ad Lab's site. I learned so much in one week, and it was fantastic. So uh, tell us a bit about those. I, I kind of just plugged the programmatic <laughs> for you, but tell, tell us what else you guys are doing, where you're taking your education, uh, who you're speaking to, and who you're teaching in the industry. Yeah, so we the Digital Ad Lab is built to address three core audiences. One is educational institutions. Educational institutions, um, there's a significant gap between what the they're taught in school in terms of coming out of advertising and marketing programs and what their experience is on the job. They come out of school and they have no idea what the what the software applications are that they're required to learn. And so this creates a significant challenge for um, um, employers because they then have to spend up to a year or a year and a half training resources um, who may they may end up losing um, after that time on those you know, platforms. Second group that we focus on is advertising professionals like yourself, people who are in the, the media and advertising space but have never really had a fundamental A to Z training in digital in terms of technologies, terminologies, and everything. And there's a lot of skills, as I mentioned, where the future is going is everything is digital, therefore everybody needs to learn digital. And so that's the second group we go after is people who are career transitioning, people who are in digital roles but need a more fundamental understanding of it. Um, uh, That's our second program uh, for advertising professionals. And our third program is specifically for marketers where we go into clients, whether they be big banks, insurance companies, uh, retailers, and so forth, and they want to understand um, the language, the technology, terminologies that they are engaging with their agencies so they have a better understanding of what their agencies are saying, but also how to ask more informed questions about how their investments are being utilized. Okay. And, Ray, if anyone wanted to take your courses, where could they find information on it? I simply go to digitaladlab.org um, or just Google Digital Ad Lab, and you'll be able to find this, and you'll see our programs are listed on there. We're, all, we're also going on a cross-Canada tour. Um, this summer where we're going to Vancouver, Calgary, um, Montreal, and Halifax, and perhaps Ottawa uh, as well. Can't forget Ottawa um, to bring the Digital Ad Lab program to Canadians. And we are going into the U.S. in 2017. Fantastic. Ray, this has been a wonderful chat. I always close with this question. If you weren't in media, what do you think you'd be doing and why? If I weren't in media, what would I be doing I probably would have been um, hacking. <laughs> <laughs> like as in showing up at the legit hackathons or as in I probably Edward would, Snowden hacking? I or? probably would be more affiliated with Anonymous than... <laughs> <laughs> you have a Guy Fox mask and everything? Uh, a Guy Fox, a big hero of mine. So, really? Yeah. I know, why is he a hero of yours? You might as well throw that out there. Uh, I, love the, I love his story. And when I saw the movie, I was just... The uh, movie V or Vendetta... Um, was just taken by his story and what he was trying to do. And sometimes the little guy has to stand up and say, you know what, there needs to be a better way. Idealism is the only way you're going to make change. That's it. You have to believe in it. Absolutely. Ray, thanks so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, Victor. Greatly appreciate it. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast or subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram 
at Vic Genova.